Hey everyone, welcome back. Ready for another deep dive. This one, um, yeah. oh, this one is going to be really interesting. We're going to be looking at the Whitman Tower incident. Yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, and this one, you know, you hear UFO and you think, oh, you know, blinking lights in the sky. Right. But this one really goes deeper, mm -hmm. and it's going to make you kind of rethink what you thought you knew about UFOs. Absolutely. So we've got all kinds of stuff for you today. Yeah, we do. We've got military reports. Like first-hand accounts. We've got first-hand accounts. Witnesses. We've even got expert analysis of the case. So we're going to be sifting through all that today. Trying to find the truth. And trying to figure out what really happened yeah. at the Whitman Tower. I think one of the things that makes this case so interesting is the setting itself. Okay. Los Angeles. Yeah, huge city. Millions of people. Millions of people, yeah. But on this particular night really dense fog rolled in oh wow and blanketed the entire city yeah eerie silence so nobody can really see anything it's almost like the fog itself was part of the mystery you know okay that's a little creepy but i like it yeah um so we had this picture this the whitman tower this massive structure dominating the skyline right this hub for broadcasting and communications exactly and inside the tower a family, Mr. and Mrs. Ryerson, and their daughter, Billy, mm -hmm. are about to experience something truly unsettling. They reported seeing these strange lights outside their window, almost as if something was hovering right there in the fog. Oh, wow. And it wasn't just seeing things. They felt this presence, a disturbing energy. Yeah. Really creepy. Oh, man. So this wasn't just, like, you know, some lights. This was, like... They felt something. Yeah, it really shook them to their core, you can tell by reading their testimonies. Yeah, and especially I was reading Billy's, their daughter's testimony. And, right. And you can just sense that fear. Right. This was a very real experience for them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's interesting? Mr. Ryerson, he worked with electronics. Totally. And microcircuitry. Hmm. I don't know if that's important or not. It's but... an interesting detail. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. But that's not all. Oh, no, that's just the beginning. Right. We also have another resident of the Whitman Tower, Mr. Rashone. Okay. He reported seeing beams of light. Okay, so multiple people in the tower are seeing things. Absolutely. And he actually told investigators that he believed his neighbors had seen, and I quote, a spaceship. Wow. Okay, so it's really starting to sound like, you know, something's going on here. Right. But... It doesn't stop there. Yeah. Right. Because we also have Mr. Emerson Keys. Yes. He's a well-known publisher. Yeah. He reported a UFO sighting over the ocean that same night. And get this. He claims to have video footage. Oh, wow. Okay. So now we've got potential, like, evidence. Right. So, I mean, I know it's natural to be skeptical when you hear about these things, right? Correct. And even the Air Force investigators, when they first got these reports, you know, they approached it cautiously. Yeah, as they should. Yeah. But they did take it seriously enough to bring in their resources. Mm -hmm. They used radar data. Right. And they really analyzed the witness testimonies. That's good. Very meticulous. That's good. You want to know they're taking it seriously? Absolutely. And you know what's interesting? What? During the investigation, they uncovered a report from a Mr. Silas Cobb. Okay. He's a traveling salesman from St. Louis. Okay. And his report described a UFO sighting that matched Mr. Key's account perfectly. Oh, wow. So somebody completely separate? Completely separate, yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is they didn't just, like, stumble upon Mr. Cobb's report. Right. They used some pretty clever detective work. Oh, really? Yeah. They traced him back through a bar receipt. How'd they get the bar receipt? Well, that's a good question. Okay. But they got it somehow. Then they contacted his wife. Oh, wow. And she gave them his hotel information. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So you can see how dedicated they were to getting to the bottom of this. Yeah, absolutely. So we have all these sightings, but the question is, how do we connect them to a specific location? Yeah, how do we know they're all seeing the same thing? Yeah, exactly. Well, they use a technique called triangulation. Right. By combining compass readings from the different witnesses, they were able to pinpoint the UFO's position. Well, that's smart. Yeah, it's clever. And this led them to another strange incident that happened that same night. Okay. A massive cargo ship, the Nakia Maru, experienced a sudden rudder cable failure. Oh, wow. Near the location of the UFO sightings. So we've got UFO sightings. We've yeah. got a ship malfunctioning. This is getting a little intense. Absolutely. Uh, um, what happened with the ship, though? It was chaos. Imagine this massive cargo ship drifting towards the beach. 
Oh, no. High winds. They had to dispatch tugboats to hold her off. Oh, gee. And then they had to bring in a helicopter to repair the rudder cable. At night? At night. Dense fog. Oh, man. The rough seas. It was a recipe for a disaster. It's just so scary. It's crazy to think this was all happening at the same time as the UFO sightings. Yeah. You have to wonder if there's a connection. Yeah. But um, I want to go back to the Whitman Tower for a sec. Okay. Because you mentioned something earlier about interference with TV and microwave signals. Right, right. So the investigators, they discovered something unusual tangled in the TV cable antenna. Oh, really? Yeah, a piece of polyvinyl chloride. PVC. Yeah, PVC, tied with a square knot. Huh. Okay, that is strange. And this seemingly insignificant detail sparked a whole new line of inquiry. Okay, I'm intrigued. Where did it lead them? Well, they traced it back to a local distributor of novelty items and stage props. Okay. A Mr. Joe Steiner. Okay, and what did they learn from Mr. Steiner? Well, that's what we'll get into next time. Okay, all right. So, we've got this mystery unfolding. Oh, yes. And it seems like we're getting closer to the truth Hopefully. of what really happened at the Whitman Tower. Mm. But for now, we'll have to leave it there. Yeah. We'll be back next time. For sure. To continue our deep dive into this fascinating case. Can't wait. All right, see you then. Bye. Well, Mr. Steiner told them that he had uh, supplied a batch of silver balloons for an aerial advertising display for a used car dealership. Okay. And these balloons, because of high winds, they were accidentally released oh, wow. and ended up drifting over the city. Wait, balloons? So are you saying these mysterious lights that everybody saw were just balloons? Well, not quite that simple. Remember Mr. Ryerson and his work with electronics? Right, right. Well, it seems these balloons, especially when they were reflecting light from aircraft beacons right. and, you know, swaying in the wind. Yeah. They could have interfered with the Whitman Tower's transmissions. Oh, I see. And created this illusion of a spacecraft. Hmm. Okay, so you're saying the Ryersons, Mr. Rashone, everybody, they were all just tricked by some runaway balloons. Well, it's it's important to remember the power of perception, mm. especially in high-stress situations. So the investigators, they actually explored the possibility of acrophobia playing a role in the Ryerson's experience. Acrophobia, that's the fear of heights. Right, exactly. And remember, they had just recently moved into this towering building. Right, and their daughter was terrified. Yes, clinging to the inner walls. Okay, yeah, that definitely points to a fear of heights. Yeah. So when you combine that fear with the overall strangeness of the situation, mm -hmm. it's it's plausible that their minds, especially in a state of heightened anxiety, could have misinterpreted what they were seeing. Yeah, our brains are always trying to make sense of the world, right? Absolutely. And in a situation that's unfamiliar and frightening, right. we tend to, you know... Fill in the blanks. Yeah, fill in the gaps with what we already know or believe. Okay. So are you saying that their fear, plus all the stuff they've probably heard about UFOs... Yeah. ...could have led them to see something that wasn't really there, precisely? It's like our brains take these shortcuts, mm. relying on pre-existing patterns and beliefs to make sense of confusing information. So... The balloons, the fog, the weird feelings they were having, yeah, that's it all that. just kind of came together. It created this perfect storm for a misinterpretation. Yeah. Okay, I see that. Their minds may have even subconsciously blocked out the memory of the balloons huh. and replaced it with something more terrifying. Oh, wow. Something that fit into their understanding of the unknown. Okay, but what about the other witnesses, though? Right. Like Mr. Keys and Mr. Cobb. They weren't in the Whitman Tower. That's a great point, and it's one of the reasons why this case is so fascinating. Okay. Because while the balloons and the psychological factors, mm. they might explain some of the sightings, yeah. they don't account for everything. Right, like that massive radar blip. Exactly. It was way bigger than anything those balloons could have produced. Right, and don't forget about the pilot. Oh, yeah. Who reportedly fractured his wrist when the cargo cable snapped during the helicopter repair. Okay, so those details, I mean, they suggest that maybe there's more to this story okay. than just balloons and mistaken identity. It seems like we're dealing with two separate mysteries. Okay, I like where this is going. Remember, the investigators initially assumed they were dealing with a single object. Right, right. 
But what if there were two separate phenomena occurring at the same time? Okay, now I'm really intrigued, so walk me through this. We have the runaway balloons, which the... explain the visual sightings and the interference with the Whitman Tower transmissions. Okay. But we also have this separate unidentified object yeah, yeah. that was responsible for that huge radar signature. Right, and that thing was way up in the sky. Exactly, far above where those balloons would have been floating. So while everybody's looking at these balloons down below, yes. something else is happening up above. Exactly, and nobody can see it because of the fog. This is crazy. And this brings us to a crucial point. Okay. The possibility that certain information about UFO encounters has been deliberately withheld from the public. You're talking about government cover-ups. It's a possibility. I've always found that so fascinating. There's actually a growing body of evidence. Really? Including testimonies from very credible sources. Haiku. Military personnel, pilots. Wow. And recently declassified documents. So they're risking a lot to tell their stories. Absolutely. And you can't just dismiss these testimonies mm. and all these hints that we find buried in declassified documents. Yeah. They raise serious questions about what our governments might know. Right. And why are they keeping it a secret? It's the sense of a hidden reality mm -hmm. that drives our fascination with UFOs. It's like we're trying to find our place in the universe. Exactly. Okay. So where does this leave us with the Whitman Tower incident? Mm hmm. We have this compelling story with potential misperceptions, right. psychological factors, mm -hmm. and maybe even something much bigger at play. It's crucial that we don't just dismiss any of these possibilities. Right. We need to embrace the complexity of the situation, mm -hmm. acknowledge the limitations of our understanding, mm -hmm. and just remain open to the possibility that the truth might be stranger than fiction. It's a reminder that even in a world that's so advanced with science and technology, yes. there are still mysteries out there. Absolutely. Lurking in the shadows, mm -hmm. yeah. waiting to be explored. Yeah, it really makes you think. I mean, the Whitman Tower incident, it's like a microcosm of this whole UFO thing, you know? <laughs> right. You have the human element, the possibility of something truly extraordinary. It's all there. And it just it shows how difficult it can be to really get to the bottom of these things. Exactly. How do we know what's real? How do we separate genuine encounters from hoaxes? Right. And then you've got government secrecy on top of everything else. It's like a puzzle with some pieces missing. And some might be fake. But even with all that, there's this, I don't know, this pull towards the unknown. Like, we need to understand our place in all of this. I get it. In the Whitman Tower case, even though we have these explanations, it still leaves you wondering, right? It does. Mm. What about those other witnesses? And that radar blip, it's like a little piece of the story is unresolved. It keeps the door open. Maybe something amazing did happen that night. And that's what's so cool about this whole topic. It challenges us to think bigger, to consider that maybe, just maybe, we're not alone. It forces us to confront what we don't know, to embrace the mystery. So I guess that's where we end up. We've looked at the human side, the evidence, even the idea of cover-ups, what's the takeaway? That the Whitman Tower case is just one small part of a much bigger story. It's a starting point. Exactly. Keep exploring, keep looking for information, keep talking about UFOs. Because maybe if we put all these cases together. All these little glimpses. Yeah, maybe then we can start to see the bigger picture. The truth is, here. <laughs>